to know you a little bit better. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 23. That's where we are going to be this morning. And over the next few weeks, we are going to be looking at the last words that Jesus said on the cross. You know, you really can tell a lot about a person by the last words that they say before they pass away. Back home in Ohio, uh, we had, there was a really famous statement, some famous last words, and it was this, hey y'all, watch this. Last words ever spoken. Some other famous last words is, honey, you don't look that fat in that. Some pretty bad famous last words. Would you agree? Hey, y'all, watch this. And you knew something stupid was getting ready to happen. Um, but that's, that's something that we said. But in, on a more serious note, you know, when you look at the last words of Jesus, he is under one of the most excruciating things um, that you could ever experience. And that was death. And not just death, but death by crucifixion. You know, when I got to visit a little bit with Brother Ken Hogue, who recently passed away, Carl read the letter um, from, from his mother, Ken wanted to talk with me about some of the fears that he had facing death, and so Kyle and I got to drive down, and we got to spend a few minutes with him, and Ken said, you know, I still believe that Jesus is the Christ who died on the cross for my sins, and he resurrected from the dead. I still believe that I'm forgiven through him. I still believe that I'll get to spend forever with God in heaven, in the new heavens, and the new earth. And you can tell a lot about a person by what they say before they die. Of course, like anybody, he had the natural fears of facing death, of leaving his family. But yet, when it came down to it, he was still a man of faith. He still believed those essential truths. And it was important enough for him to verbalize and for him to say you know, when Jesus was on the cross, he had some famous last words that he said as well. There's actually seven different statements that Jesus had to say on the cross. But in order to really understand the magnitude of these words, it's helpful, rather than looking at the crucifixion, to walk back a week and look at what happened leading up to the crucifixion. Jesus was, of course, the predicted Messiah that was the long-awaited one. And upon entering Jerusalem, he was entering what's called what we call the Passion Week where Jesus is going to celebrate the Passover. And so as he enters Jerusalem, he's riding upon a donkey, and the, the crowds come out, people come to the streets, and they begin singing and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be Jesus, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And they worshiped and praised him. And then just a week later, the same people who yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna, were the same people who yelled, crucify, crucify. When Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane, he was so upset. His emotions were so intense that he actually had a medical condition where he actually bled drops of blood that permeated through his skin. Not just sweat, but sweat mixed with blood. It is a medical condition that we're well aware of today. Can you imagine experiencing that kind of suffering to where you were praying so intensely before the Father, knowing of your oncoming crucifixion and execution, that you would pray and sweat with blood would pour from your body. Here he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying to God, knowing that his crucifixion is about to come, and he takes three friends with him, and he says, look, all I want you to do is pray with me. And they couldn't even pray with Jesus. They kept falling asleep. I mean, can you imagine going to someone in a time of need, asking them to pray for you, and they are just so into themselves, they can't even stay awake for one hour to pray. And here's Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And as he's praying, you could probably see the flicker of lights and you could hear the banging of chains as a group of religious thugs come to arrest Jesus in secret in the garden of Gethsemane. They punch him. They spit on him. They actually blindfold him and hit him and say, can you prophesy who actually hit you? If you're the God that you claim to be, if you're the chosen one, tell us who hit you. Complete humiliation. After they bound him up, they took, a, they took him before a few religious leaders who charged him with false accusations. They gathered up some false witnesses who said certain things about Jesus that weren't true. And again, they spat upon him. They punched him in the face. They mocked him and they laughed him. And then they charged him with blasphemy. But like a lot of religious zealots, they didn't want to do the dirty work themselves. So they brought him before Pilate. And after all, Pilate's the one who can sanction his death and sanction his, his uh, crucifixion or his punishment. And so they bring him before Pilate. And you know what Pilate finds? Nothing. There's nothing wrong with Jesus. He's innocent. There's no charge that can actually stick against Jesus. And so here's what Pilate decides to do. <coughs> He's going to bring out Jesus. 
And he's going to bring out a criminal, a criminal named Barabbas. And every year, every year, the Romans would release a criminal back into the community if they, if they wanted him back. And so here is this hardened criminal. He's probably a murderer. He's definitely a thief. I mean, he is the lowest of the low. He's the worst of the worst. It would be like the most heinous gang member that you can imagine. And he brings out Barabbas, and he brings out Jesus, and he says, which one do you want? A week later, they're praising Jesus. A week later, they cry, give us Barabbas. We want Barabbas. And so Jesus is sanctioned to be beaten by the Romans. But that wasn't enough. What led to Jesus' beatings and crucifixion was the fact that he was betrayed by one of his closest followers named Judas. And you know how much money he betrayed Jesus for? 30 pieces of silver. He sold Jesus out to the religious leaders, all for money. Can you imagine what that would feel like to be sold out by one of your closest friends for money? And then you have another friend who could stand up and who could speak up for you, but yet in the moment that it all counted, he decided to deny Jesus, and his name was Peter. He went on to be one of the greatest apostles that we know of the, the first church. But he denied Jesus three times. Can you imagine what it would feel like to have your closest friend, your best ally, say, I don't know that man, and then to curse you? That's what Jesus experienced. And so here he is before the Roman um, uh, executioners. They were so skilled that they could beat you within an inch of your life and not kill you. They knew which body places to hit. They knew which tendons to cut. They knew exactly what to do to inflict the most amount of pain that they possibly could without killing you. And so they beat Jesus 39 times with a rod. And then they took a leather whip that we call cat nine tails Basically, it had a handle that was wooden with leather strips, about nine of them. And they would wrap pieces of metal and pieces of uh, bone on the ends so that when they would hit you, it wouldn't just bruise you or sting, but it would literally tear the skin from your body. In fact, the New Testament and the Old Testament represent Jesus as looking like it was, it was hamburger meat hanging from his body. His muscles and his tendons would literally have been dangling off the bone after the kind of beating that Jesus went through. And that wasn't enough. They then took a purple cloak, uh, robe after his blood began to dry and they wrapped it around him and then they ripped it off and they mocked him and they hit him and they spit upon him. They took a crown of thorns, which not like the little thorn bushes that you get when you walk through the woods. We're talking about large one to two inch thorns that they embedded upon his skull that would pierce his skull. And they crushed it down and they hailed him. Oh, you're the king of the Jews. You're the king of the Jews. And they mocked him. And then they put his own cross on his own back. And they told him to take the march of death up to what we call the Hill of Calvary, where he will now experience the most painful, excruciating part of his journey, the crucifixion. So if you'll join me in Luke chapter 23, we're going to start in verse 26 where it says this, Now as they led him, being Jesus away, they laid a hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Part of the crucifixion process was that you would actually have to care the long wooden piece upon which your hands would be nailed to the cross. You would have to carry that. So they would tie it to you and you would carry it and you would march outside of the city up to what they called the hill of the skull where then you would be laid upon the cross and you would be crucified. But Jesus has been beaten so bad. He is so utterly exhausted that he can't even carry his own cross. And so thankfully, here came this man, um, Simon, who was actually from the northern part of Africa, and he came in from the countryside. So he wasn't a part of the mob that yelled out, crucify, crucify. And he was strong enough to be able to bear this cross for Jesus so that he could carry that cross up the hill and be crucified. And so here is Jesus, utterly exhausted, completely worn down, unable to carry his own cross, and now somebody else have to carry his own cross for him. Kind of says a lot about discipleship. If you want to follow Jesus, you got to be willing to bear your own cross and follow him up to the hill of Calvary if you want to die with him and if you want to live with him. Look what it goes on to say in verses 27 through 31. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women also mourned him and laminated him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed, the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. 
Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done when it is dry? And so here is Jesus at the point of the, the, the worst part where he has to carry his own cross up the hill where he's going to be crucified. And these women are following him and they're crying after him. They're seeing the suffering that he's endured, an innocent man who's not worthy to be crucified or punished. And he looks at these women and he says, do not mourn for me. In other words, you think I'm being judged by the Romans and by the religious leaders, but I am not out of control. No, if you're going to mourn for somebody, mourn for yourselves because a day is coming in which God's wrath is going to be poured out on the nation of Israel. We know that as 70 AD, when Titus, the emperor's son, came and marched upon Jerusalem and circled the city. And Jerusalem, Israel, experienced one of the most horrific things to ever encounter a nation. They starved. They ate their own children. They poisoned their own food. They were crucified about 800 people a day, and they were disemboweled because they all swallowed their gold, hoping to escape the city. I mean, what they went through was absolutely horrific. And Jesus said, look, there's going to come a day when you are going to experience some of the worst tribulation that you could ever imagine for what you did to me today. The mountains and the hills would actually represent this this symbol of safety, that if you wanted to be saved, if you wanted to escape tribulation and trouble, you could actually go to the mountains and run to the hillsides and you would be protected. Because most of us know, if you know anything about military tactics, when you have a a superior position, you can often defend yourself, you can hide from the enemy very easily. And so what became the symbol of protection, Jesus said, is now going to be a sanction of death. The very things that you think are going to protect you are the very things that you are going to cry out for your own death. That's how horrible it's going to be. And he says, here's another illustration. He says, if this is how it goes when there is green trees, what do you think it's going to be like when there are brown trees, when there are dry trees? In other words, if this is what God permitted to happen to me, an innocent man, what do you think God is going to allow to happen to the Israelites who are guilty of crucifying and killing the innocent Son of God? Do not mourn for me. Mourn for yourselves for what the nation of Israel has done to me. And he illustrates this very powerful point. I am still in control, even through my crucifixion. And so as you can imagine, Jesus has experienced one of the most horrific things a person could ever experience. Abandoned by his friends, persecuted by the people who were supposed to be the religious leaders, beaten, humiliated, falsely accused, and now he's going to endure the most painful way to die, which is crucifixion. Look what it goes on to say in verse 32. It says, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. As as if it couldn't get any worse right? Not only are you now going to be crucified, but you are now going to be crucified in the midst of two criminals who actually probably deserved it. They didn't just steal, right? So we know the thief on the cross, but they probably did some things that were absolutely horrendous, things like rape and murder. Look, crucifixion was such a painful, horrible way to die that Rome banned it from being a punishment for their own citizens. If you were a Roman citizen, you weren't allowed to be crucified. That's how bad it was. But as if Jesus hasn't experienced enough, now he's going to be humiliated, being hung on a cross between two criminals who were the worst of the worst and the low of the low. And here he is, being set apart for death, carrying his own cross that he's too weak to bear, humiliated by now being crucified in the midst of two criminals, and it gets worse. It says in verse 33, and when they had come to the place called Calvary, or maybe your translations have Golgotha, or maybe it has the place of the skull. Calvary is the Latin term for the place of the skull. There they crucified him and the other criminals, one on his right hand, and the other on his left. And so his skull has been pressed in with a crown of thorns, and now he's going to die on the place of the skull. And the place of the skull isn't just some random location. It was a point where everyone could witness and see the criminals who were being crucified. It was to set the tone for the Roman community. If you don't want to abide by our laws, look what's going to happen. And so he's humiliated, not just by being crucified between two criminals, but he's being humiliated by being punished and killed in the worst place that you could ever imagine, in the most public place that you could ever imagine. And if you don't know anything about crucifixion, you didn't die from blood loss. You died because you suffocated to death. 
What they would do is they would take very large metal spikes and they would drive them, not through your hands, but through your wrist, and they would crush the artery, which would send excruciating pain up through your shoulders and throughout your whole body. They would do the right hand and the left hand, they would cross the feet, and they would do the exact same thing. They would crush the main nerve through the feet. And so you had shots of pain that would fly through your body. And the only way that you could live on the cross was by pressing up against those nails so that you could breathe. Because the moment you let your body down, you would cut off the air supply to your lungs and you would suffocate to death. In fact, if there was going to be a storm, which happened in the place of Jesus, they would break your knees so that you would be forced to die because you could no longer hold yourself up. Certain historians have documented people have lived on the cross for four days, struggling to breathe, struggling to live. It was the worst way to die. But it got even worse. Look what happened. Look what the soldiers did. It says, when they had brought him uh, to the place, look at verse 34, to be crucified. Look at what the criminals do. They begin casting lots, verse 34 says, for his clothing. So it wasn't enough to humiliate him in front of everyone, to beat him, to maim his body. So here he is hanging on a cross. His meat is falling off his bones like ribbons, of, like strings of ribbons. He's been pressed with a crown of thorns on his head. He's been forsaken by his friends. He's been betrayed by his friends, spat upon, falsely accused, humiliated. And now they're going to strip his body of his clothes so that he hangs there naked. Ultimate humiliation for Jesus. But here's the deal. In the midst of the most excruciating thing that he ever endured, what did Jesus have to say? What were the last words that he cried out from the cross? Well, we all know in verse 33 and 34, Father is the first thing he says. You know when you stub your toe, what's the, if you're going to curse God, what's the first thing that you say? God, right? Because when you're in the midst of your sin, when you're a sinful person, you don't address God as your father. You address him as God, the one who is bringing the wrath, right? So you'll say the curse word and God will be that. You never say, oh, father, nobody does that. But yet here is Jesus at the worst point in his life, still addresses God as his father, the one who is his, his only begotten special relationship, Abba, father, daddy. And look at what he says, forgive them. He cries out for forgiveness on the cross. For who? The very Roman centurions, the the criminals, really, is what they were for crucifying an innocent man. The very people who inflicted the most horrendous pain that you could ever imagine is the very people that he cries out for forgiveness. Forgiveness is available to you is what Jesus is saying on the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but that probably wouldn't be the first thing on my mind if I were to go through something like that. I mean, most of us can't even drive on the road without invoking God's cursing upon them, right? I mean, think about this, okay? I, I drive on the road a little bit because I live a little bit farther away from the church. And everybody knows when they encounter that person who's driving at or below the speed limit in the farthest left-hand lane, Okay? As a person who's right behind that person, you are obligated with a moral duty to get that person over to the slow lanes, are you not? So here I am driving, and there are are several cars behind me, I lost count, and there's this one person in the left-hand lane going really slow, and so now I bear the burden of responsibility to get this person out of the way. So what's the first thing that you do to be civil, right? You flash your lights, flash your lights, right? So here I am, flashing my lights, not getting the message. Okay? And you can see them because they're, they're looking up in the mirror, but yet they're dedicated to driving one way. And so what the worst part about this is, is that when you're in heavy traffic, there's somebody going in the other lane that is riding right beside of them. So there's this blockade that you cannot pass. And so now you begin hand movements of this is going to make any difference. So you start waving your hands up and down, move over, get out of the way, you're in my lane, get to the side so that I can go by you is what you're trying to communicate not getting the message. So thankfully, okay, I didn't have my kids with me, but thankfully the person in the right-hand lane slowed up just enough to where I could get around them and then move on, right? So that's what I do. I get around them and I do this. You know, you're riding, you go. (laughs) Shake your head and move on. But you know what? They don't care. But here's the deal. Not everybody is like me, okay? Not everybody is Christian. I never sin when I'm on the road. (laughs) So the person behind me 
now gets behind me and then pulls over in front of them and slams on their brakes. You want to do that to us? Well, we're going to pay you back. You think you think you were going slow. Now you're going to go even slower. And deep down inside, you're kind of like, yes. You know what I mean? They are getting what they deserve. How does it feel, buddy? (laughs) That is with our driving. Imagine what it would be like actually going through something bad, right? It is not in our instinct and in our nature to offer forgiveness to people. At a church that I was at, there was an elder, and there was a problem in a church. And actually, it's a really sad story. There was a man who was married to, and he wasn't, he wasn't the greatest thing that there was to offer, okay? But sometimes you can tell, man, you're like, Glad I'm not married to them. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of person that he was married to. And he wanted, he wanted to, to get a divorce from her. And he ended up committing adultery. Not a good thing, right? It is sin, absolute sin. And so he actually ended up getting a brain tumor and passing away. It's awful. He, he never got a divorce from his wife, but he got a brain tumor and he passed away. And at the funeral, you know what the elder said? Got what he deserved. Now think about that. We, we, we have a shock, but I think everybody, and I know I'm speaking for myself, has thought the exact same thing sometimes. Have we not? And isn't there a little bit in us that kind of relishes when we see people who have done something wrong, we're like, ah, you got what you deserved. It's that, it's that justice inside of us that is at peace and happy about it. Yet here's Jesus hanging on the cross going through the most excruciating thing that he could ever go through, and the words that are uttered from his lips are, Father, forgive them. The Greek word forgiveness is aphemai, right, in this text of Scripture. It's the same word used in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. It literally means to release, to send away, to let go, to drop down. In Greek literature, they would actually use it of carrying something and then dropping it and just letting it go. Teachers would often use this word to move from subject to subject. We have now moved on from this. And so when Jesus prays for forgiveness for them, he says, God, would you let this go? Would you release them from this crime? Would you not hold it to their account? When you look in the Old Testament, the Old Testament was written in what's called the original Aramaic and Hebrew, but then it was translated into Greek, and we call that the Septuagint, right? It's the Old Testament version of the Greek. And so this word is actually used in very powerful symbolic ways. Let me give you a few examples. Isaiah 38, 17, when it talks about this idea of forgiveness, for you have cast all of my sins, God, behind your back. Isaiah 43, 25, I will not remember your sins, God says. God says, look, when I look at your sins and I forgive you, it's going to be as if I don't remember them. Now remember, this is a symbol. This is a powerful um, imagery of what it's like for God to forgive us. The powerful thing about God's love for us is he doesn't forgive our sins. He chooses not to hold our sins to our account. And he loves us and moves towards us. Even in the midst of seeing everything that we've ever done, God still loves us and he's willing to forgive us. And it's so powerful that it's as if God doesn't remember. Look at this other passage of scripture. Jeremiah 34, 34, I will remember their sins no more. Psalms 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In the Old Testament, they would often use this word of letting a prisoner go, of pardoning someone, of releasing someone of their payment. Isn't that powerful? They would actually have a day in the Old Testament called the Day of Atonement, where they would bring two goats. One, they would put all of their sins upon symbolically, and this goat would be killed in their place. It was as if the goat was taking their punishment so that God could overlook their sins for one day when Jesus would die on the cross for ours. And so they would symbolically place their sin, the sin of the nation, on this goat, and they would sacrifice this goat as an offering to God. Then they would take the other goat, and they would transfer their sins on to, to that goat, and they would send the goat out into the wilderness for the releasing of their sins. So in one sense, their sins are being paid for through this goat being sacrificed. And in another powerful symbol, the goat is now carrying their sins into the wilderness as if they were never to come back and they would be remembered no more. That is the powerful imagery of what Jesus is crying out on the cross. God, send their sins away to never be remembered anymore. And there's really good news If that forgiveness applied to the criminals who crucified Jesus, that forgiveness is extended to you 
and to me. It's offered to us because of what Jesus did on the cross. Isaiah 53 is one of the most powerful passages of Scripture. It says this, Jesus, this coming servant, the Messiah, the long-awaited one, he was pierced for whose transgressions? Ours. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us to fall upon him. The Old Testament saints looked forward to the day of this, this one that they waited for, and they knew forgiveness would be possible. Being right with God would be possible. Having someone take my place to get the punishment that I deserve, would be possible. Being forgiven would be possible through Jesus. And he did it for me. He took what I deserved, what was rightly due me, and he accepted his fate. And he paid the penalty for my sins. That's the promise of the cross. The question is why? Why the cross? Why couldn't God just say, hey, look, I forgive you, right? Like we do. Here's why. When you look and understand the nature of God, God has certain character traits, certain personality aspects of his nature. God is just. God is absolutely just. And in his justiceness, he refuses to allow sin to go unpunished. The sins that we commit must have a punishment. There's no escape of that. And so you can't get away from the punishment. But at the same time, God loves And so God desires to forgive us. He desires to have a relationship with us. And so if you can feel this tension within God's God's person, he has to punish sin, while at the same time, he desires to forgive us. He wants a relationship with us. And you know, I think about it with me as a father. I feel this tension too, and maybe you parents, you can understand this as well, is that when your child does something that is wrong, you have this, this rightness in your heart that wants to discipline them. Why? Because your child deserves to be disciplined for the wrong thing that they've done. When Piper pushes, knocks down on purpose to get away from her toys, she does something that is wrong. She has caused injury to my little handsome man is what I call him, right? She's hurt him. And I'm like, Piper, no, you can't do that. And so I put her in timeout or I'll discipline her in some way, shape, or form. But at the same time, I want to forgive Piper because she's my child. I don't want to hurt her. It's not my desire to inflict punishment or injury upon my kid. I love her. And I feel this tension as a dad that I need to punish my kids so they're not going to re-raise like a little brat who does whatever they want. But at the same time, I love my child. I want to forgive them. I want them to know that, that dad loves them. And so whenever I do discipline Piper every night before bed, every single night, I get on my knees and I give her a kiss and I say, I love you so much. And she goes, so much. It's awesome. She doesn't say, I love you so much, but I know that's what she's trying to say. I love you so much. And it's the greatest thing in the world. It's one of the best parts of my day. And I give her a kiss, and now she knows what kisses are, and she plants a big kiss on my lips. And I don't care if she's sick, doesn't matter. I'm kissing my little sweet girl. God has the same tension. He needs to punish our sin because it's the right thing to do, while at the same time, he desires to forgive us. And so the key idea is simply this. In God's justice, it demands punishment. It demands wrath. But love desires forgiveness. That's why the cross is the answer. Jesus took our place. He died in our place. He took the punishment that we deserve. And God was able to punish Jesus for our sins. And he's able to look at us and say, I forgive you. I've released your sins. You've paid the penalty. I remember them no more. I've cast them as far as the east is from the west. I've sent them off. I've let them go. I've released them. I've bought you back into my family because I love you. That's the promise of the cross. That's why Jesus uttered these last famous words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You see, through the cross, God gave Jesus our penalty, but through faith, we get to receive Jesus' righteousness. You see, Jesus didn't only take our place, but we took his. God not only paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, but then he took Jesus' righteous life, and he did what the Bible calls imputed it or reckoned it. It's a a banking term for credit and debit. You get this credited to your account. So it's not as if all of your debt's been paid. No, God now takes the righteous life of Jesus and he 
credits it to your account so you can stand before God. And you know who you look like before God? You look like Jesus. When he sees you, he doesn't see your sin, which was paid for on the cross. He sees Jesus' righteousness, a perfect moral life given to your account. And guess what? Guess how much you have to pay for it? Zero. It's free. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. The only thing that you can do is meet the conditions to accept it. Let me read you a powerful passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says this, He, being God, made him, being Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see that duality there? Jesus became the penalty for our sin on the cross so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus took the punishment that we deserve and then we got the righteous life that he earned by living perfect, an obedient life, never sinned, never did anything wrong. That is now credited to our account through the cross. That's why the cross is so important. Romans chapter 5, verse 9, one of the most powerful pieces of Scripture in all of the Bible says this, but God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we are made right by his blood, shall we be saved from the wrath of God through him? It is through the cross that we were saved from God's wrath because Jesus took our place and then credited it, his righteous life to us. And all you have to do is meet the conditions that God has laid out in scripture to accept it. That's it. Be faithful. Place your faith and your trust in him. Turn away from your sinful lifestyle. It literally means to change your attitude about sin, to begin walking away from it. Be baptized in Jesus' name and live a faithful life. That is the conditions that God wants us to meet in order to accept God's grace and his forgiveness. It is such good news. We are saved by grace through faith with a repentant heart at the time of baptism that we may live a good life. That is the promise of the cross. Forgiveness can be extended to you if you're willing. But we shouldn't end with this idea that we can be forgiven. We need to understand the magnitude of our sin. So let me recap just a few things for you. What does God do through the cross? First of all, God removes our guilt, which helps us overcome our shame. We're no longer guilty. It's removed. It's gone. You know, when I think about a criminal who pays his, his penalty, right? People who break the law, so you go to prison for five years, you've paid your, fen- your, your penalty. You've given what was due. But isn't your criminal record always distorted? And always, you can never get that federal offense off your criminal record, can you? It's not the way it is with God. He not only pays your penalty, he wipes your, your slate clean. That's the promise of the cross. Second of all, through the, co- through the cross, God demonstrates his righteousness by punishing sin. You know, through forgiveness, it's not something that we deserve, it's not something that we earn, but God punishes sin through the cross. So we can look at God and say, God, you've done the right thing because you have punished sin through the cross. God isn't just going to forgive Hitler. Hitler would have to come to faith in Jesus and live an obedient life. God isn't going to forgive murderers and rapists and liars and thieves. The only way that they can truly attain forgiveness is through the cross. And so God punishes our sin there through the cross. He removes our shame and our guilt, and he demonstrates that he is a righteous God and that he does not just overlook sin. He deals with it. And then thirdly, God demonstrates his love by substituting himself in our place. He took your place. He took my place. And we can't get arrogant, and we can't become prideful about what that means. Let's end with verse 34, because it's really important. When he cries on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians. If they would have realized they were crucifying the Son of glory, they wouldn't have done it. They were ignorant. But ignorance does not necessarily mean innocence. They still had to embrace the cross. You know, we look at people like that and we say, I'm not that bad. You know what I mean? I mean, they're bad. I'm not that bad. They crucified Jesus, and all I've done is lied a little bit, right? They beat Jesus with a cat of nine tails, and, you know, I've lusted after other women, or I've taken something that wasn't mine, and we look at people who have done really bad things, and we try to justify ourselves by the bad things that they do. But you know what the Bible teaches? If you hate your brother, it says you're a murderer. 
If you have lusted after a woman or a man to commit adultery with them, you have already become an adulterer or an adulteress. If you've had greed or lust for money, Paul tells Timothy that you have taken the sword and you have run yourself through. You've pierced yourself through with many sorrows. Here's the reality. The stick that they beat Jesus with, it's ours. The cat of nine tails that they whip Jesus with, we've been guilty of the exact same thing in many ways, not directly, but in principle. The words that we speak, the venom that we share, the posts that we write that cut people and hurt them very, very deeply. We're greedy. We're lustful. We sin. We make mistakes. We are imperfect people. I probably the foremost. But forgiveness is possible and forgiveness is available to us. One of my favorite passages of scripture is Romans chapter 8, where he is building this case of salvation through faith in Jesus. Salvation through faith in Jesus. He starts off in chapters 1 and 2, things are really bad. Chapters 3 through 4, things are even worse, but it can get better through faith in Jesus. We can die to sin and live a new life, chapters 5 through 6. And then in Romans chapter 8, he starts off with verse 1, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he says, let me illustrate this point to you. Let me make sure that you get it. He says, for God did not spare his own son. Will he not freely give us all things? It's an argument from the greater to the least. For even God did not spare Jesus on the cross. Do you really think that he's not going to forgive you? Do you really think that you've done too many bad things to where forgiveness isn't available to you? That's not true. Why isn't it true? Because of the cross. Don't get distracted by Satan's lies or your own hurt and your own pain by thinking that forgiveness isn't available to you because it is. And the Bible's very clear. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 36 through 38, Peter's preaching the gospel, and he says, Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know that this Jesus, whom you, the nation of Israel, have crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. And in verse 37, it says they were sick to their stomach. They were pierced to the heart. They were so convicted. And they asked this question, men and brethren, what shall we do? And you know what Peter said in verse 38? I said it earlier. He said, repent. Repent. Turn away from your sins and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And these are the conditions that you need to meet. And it's simple. Accept the gospel through the plan of salvation. I'm going to ask that you stand and we're going to pray and sing a song of invitation. And if you want to embrace the forgiveness of God, we want to welcome you down to do that this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks, Father.